So what you see here is a luggage belt in an airport. It's usually the place where, after a long flight, you expect your luggage to arrive, if you are lucky, right? Actually, it turns out, in an airport serving around 5 million people per year, around four to five of these people decide to take a joyride on the luggage belt. This is actually a nightmare for security. They want to detect it, they want to prevent it, they want to find a way to be able to solve this issue. And we usually are the guys who are involved to try to solve these issues and similar like these. I work in a field, as mentioned before, of machine vision and artificial intelligence. So we have a team of people being involved in trying to solve real-time issues which might be relevant to different kind of customers or anybody else. Let me tell you how it all started. So it all started back in 2011. We were invited by a railroad company to solve a problem which was actually solved already a long time before. So what they had was a very simple issue. Every year, around a million wagons in a bit less number of trains arrives to a country. What happens then is they stop in the first station, five train inspectors using walkie-talkies jump out of the building next to the train station, and they walk next to the wagons. And they say, hey, this is number one, this is the wagon number here, these are the defects, these are the things you find about it, this is how it works. It was not really a very efficient process. It had a multitude of problems, as you can imagine. First of all, it is never a good idea to put a person next to a 60-ton moving wagon, as you can imagine. So that's a safety issue. Second of all, it's prone to human error, so people can make mistakes. And, you know, when they do this over walkie-talkies, when somebody writes it down, sends it over fax machines, which is really long time, long historical technology, back to the center, somebody re-enters this, this is not efficient at all. And, of course, another thing is there, this itself is not really a profession where you can expect really high growth. Like, you can't really become the best in it or do it the fastest. It doesn't make much sense, as you can imagine. So we were invited to solve this issue back then. And after half a year, or a year, so to speak, it turned out that we first failed miserably. It turned out we couldn't solve the issue straight away with the technology which was employed in many places around the world. Let me give you some of the reasons. First of all, you get yellow numbers and white and these kind of things. Second of all, sometimes I get the feeling people who actually write these numbers have a special hatred for using templates, as you can imagine there. Next thing, the wagon to the right, it's supposed to be clean. As you can see, it's a quite a problem to see the number over there, even with your eyes, even with the naked eye. So that's another issue which you might have. So we were fighting with this for a long time. Then, in one of the meetings, one of the younger researchers, who was not the software developer, who was not an engineer, said, hey, you know, but when you look at the wagons, for specific types of wagons, the numbers are in very specific locations. So why don't we use the first identification of the type of the wagon, and then we know where to search for the number, which makes our job much easier. So this was actually quite successful. It turned out this way we can do this. We can actually help the guys to solve the problem. So after this, we started actually bragging about ourselves. You know, we had this major success. That coincided with the time when artificial intelligence and machine vision actually became something like of a little bit of a hype around the world. So everybody was saying, this is really cool. We should use this technology everywhere. So we were wandering around and saying, yes, we did it. We are really good at it. We can help you solve any problems, whatever you have. It didn't take long. After a short period of time, we actually were invited by a municipality to solve a problem they had. So they had two roads. One of the roads was leading to a nice beach, which in the summer people went sunbathing, doing everything else. Second one was actually the one which was more practical. That was the one which was going to the next village. So people were using their bicycles, riding to the shops, to sit to town center, doing all these things. And that was much more practical. So they had, they had a question. Which one should we develop? And we said, yeah, of course we can solve it. That should be very easy, right? So the solution we came up with at the time being was very, very simple. We said, OK, what we can do? We can actually see if there is a motion. So we're going to place a camera on a pole. We're going to see if there is a motion there. If there is a motion there, we will look at the picture 
and see if there is a bicycle on the picture, right? If there is a bicycle, we say plus one. Everybody's happy, we know the number of cyclists. True? Then we run into this. By some accident, somebody actually drew a bicycle on the pavement in front of the camera. So as soon as somebody walked by that, you know, motion, hmm, bicycle, plus one. This was rather easy to solve, right? So we trained the system to understand that this is not an actual bicycle, right? So actual cyclist looks a little bit different, and there is a context and all the other things. But then we ran into another problem. So we solved this one. On a, and then on a hot summer day, we suddenly noticed there is a number, there is a rise in the number of cyclists, but on the wrong road, on the one leading to the next town, not to the beach. Why? So we started investigating this issue, and it turned out there was a small problem with this as well. One of the cyclists had bought an ice cream in the local town store, and he was going back home. So he stopped somewhere. The best place he figured out to stop was right in the front of our camera. We really didn't like the guy too much at that point of time, as you can imagine. So what he did, he started unpacking his ice cream. Movement, cyclist, plus one. Then he, he raised it up to his mouth, eat it, movement. Cyclist, plus one. And within 15 minutes, he did it. You can imagine, we get like 300 cyclists <laughs> out of nowhere, out of the blue. So you can imagine, there is a special type of, as we understood, there's a special type of love for the cyclist versus ice cream and all the other things. <laughs> this was something actually one of our customers told us how to solve. In one of the meetings, he said, hey, but you know, why don't you just follow the guy in the video, you have the video stream, right? You just follow him as he moves around, and you just count him once. This was the solution we came up with, the one we actually employ, which turned out to be much more successful, so it didn't get interrupted by somebody eating ice cream, you know, pushing buttons on the phone, and all the other things. But not all the stories we had were the ones with the happy endings. So let me tell you a little bit more about the ones which did not. So first of all, let's start with the one I started with in the very beginning. So people taking joyride on luggage belt, right? There were two ways to solve this the way we saw it. First of all, we tried the one where we said, okay, let's train the system to understand what a human on luggage belt looks like. How do we do it? We don't have enough data. It's only four people per year on the luggage belt, right? So we, did, we, we got our guys on the luggage belt <laughs> in different kind of positions, as you can imagine and try to create some data to train the system, okay? Well, it didn't turn out to be that great. We didn't have enough data still, and there were still some errors, so we came up with another idea. Actually, the customer came up with another idea. He said, hey, why don't we use the thermal imaging where we can see the temperature of the person? Even intoxicated person has a temperature of 36.6 degrees, more or less, give or take. It turned out the issue was that it's not only that. Within, the only, within the, all the two days of the summer we usually get here, real summer, suitcases turn out to have the same temperature because they stand out next to the airplane, you know, in the sun. So that was an actual failure. So that, and being really not happy about having too many false positives or false negatives, this was a problem which we didn't manage to solve. So this is still an open challenge, which we have. Then another one, let me talk about that one, I don't think you can see what is here. The, the thing on the right is actually one of the last images one of our systems took in the small town of Liepai, well, not so small, but still, where somebody decided that, it's, well, there is a pole, there is a camera, why don't you just, just pull it down, right? So this is no machine vision. This is no artificial intelligence. There was a very simple solution you can see on the right. You put these sticky things on the pole, and hopefully nobody else climbs it anymore. So that's fairly simple. But there was another thing related to artificial intelligence and machine vision, which we actually had to solve and which we didn't manage to solve. So the customer we had, they said, okay, now you count cyclists, you count pedestrians, everybody's really happy about it. Why, just, why don't you count the stray dogs? How many stray dogs are there? How many you know, dogs running around without people? You know, a guy like this, really nice. Yeah, it's not year 2000, but still, it's, a bit, it's uh, daytime. The question which turned out to be a problem was that it's not that easy to understand, to identify, even by a person, 
what a stray dog is. There's no human in sight. It doesn't mean the human is not nearby, right? So that's another issue which we have. So we were not really able to identify the clear definition of the problem, what a stray animal means. So how long do you follow it? How long do you see if it's a stray animal or not? So this is still an open challenge which we, which we still have. But along this way, as I said, we get invited to solve different kinds of problems using vision and intelligence. But there were several frustrations which we ended up noticing along the way, and several learnings which we got along the way. First of all, as you can see, this has been a bumpy road. So some solutions are there, some are not. First one we got was actually quite interesting. Whenever you look at the research, whenever you look at the data which is presented publicly, you usually get things like saying, you know, this is the sample data we used, these are the pictures, and then you just train the system to say to classify them. That's fairly simple, usually, the way it works. It turned out when you have to do the acquisition of the images yourself, you learn a lot more about what are the issues with actual photography. I'm no photographer. I mean, my wife always says that the easiest way to ruin a picture is to give the camera to me, right? This is actually a clear example of that, as you can see. I was trying to catch a car. <laughs> Not that successful. Yeah, but still, I and our team know way more than we would like to about photography. I'm still a crappy photographer. Don't ask me to do any photos. But now we know much more about what the uh, motion blue rays and other things which are related to this, how to build the lighting system and everything else, so these kind of things. So that's one more there. Other thing which is important was researcher frustration. Many times in our team, we got young guys coming back and saying, hey, you know, we tried to use this research, which is publicly available, which is the newest thing in the field. Everybody should be really happy about it, but it doesn't work. And then we started investigating why. It turns out there are quite a few problems in that one. First of all, in many cases, the research has some small hidden things. So it's publicly available, but some of the data is hidden. Second of all, in many cases, it's trained to be used under very, cert very specific circumstances. So that's another issue which you, which you might have, right? The third thing which we learned, third frustration we had, was the frustration of the problem owner. So the problem owner usually was presented with an idea that, you know, artificial intelligence, machine vision is here to solve all your issues right now. It's already here. It's beaten chess masters in chess, go masters in go, learn to play games, a lot of different kind of things. But when you try to apply this to a very, very simple real world problems, you either end up having something which is very, very expensive and high tech, or which doesn't work the way you intended it to work. So the conclusions we had, the things we came up with in the end of the day, actually were fairly simple. First of all, we understood that it, we need to deconstruct the problem. We need to split it up in pieces. And this is not necessarily where software engineers and engineers in general prevail. Sometimes it has to be people who actually might have a different point of view on things, people who are involved with these problems on a daily basis. So you deconstruct it into small pieces, and then you figure out which are the areas where you want to apply artificial intelligence, and which are the areas where you just use plain logic, which are the areas where you try to come up with things which are very, very simple, maybe, in some cases. Sometimes you can call this cheating, but I mean, let's call this, it's a be, there's a better word for this, let's call this hacking. And the main conclusion which we, which we drew from this, that apart from everything else, it's not just mathematicians, not just programmers who need to get involved with these things. These are people just like you sitting in here, doing many, very many different things, being problem owners, and having the understanding on how these things are built, how they function, who together with the intelligence and the engineers and maybe software developers can come up with the best solution for the thing, which not always is just artificial intelligence, which in many cases is a combination of logic and other things. Thank you.